Thank you, Janice and Mark. Janice, you've come all the way from uh, the annex, and we appreciate that. And uh, Mark, slightly further afield, and uh, we appreciate that as well. Mark just got in yesterday around 6, I guess, from, <laughs> yeah. from Europe. Yeah. Um, so February 24th, we had the beginning 4 AM, the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, these things don't happen suddenly on February uh, 24th. Things are building. There's a context. Um, this has been building, I suppose, at least since 2014, if not uh, since 1991 on independence, perhaps. Uh, so we're going to talk. I'm going to start with Mark and um, ask you a little bit about, about on the ground. You've just come out of your latest reporting trip, I think, on Saturday. And you know, what are you seeing on the ground? What does the second phase of the war look like? I think people are fairly exultant to the, the first phase. You know, Ukraine um, uh, didn't roll over and bloodied the nose of Russia. But is that something that, um, are we all getting too overexcited in some ways? I think so, yes. I mean, um, the, 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 no, no one, frankly, uh, outside of uh, perhaps the um, Ukrainian military leadership expected the first phase of the war would go the way it did. Um, Western and Russian military predictions were that Kyiv would fall within 72 hours. We were operating, uh, myself and my colleagues, on that assumption and were trying to get outside of the encirclement of Kyiv in those first days, uh, encirclement that obviously failed. Um, and so now what the, the stage we're in is we can drive around. It's safe to return to Kyiv safe-ish. I wouldn't uh, recommend a holiday there just yet. Um, but for, for journalists, it's possible to work there. Some restaurants are, are reopening. Some hotels are functioning. And you, the, the, so we're in this uh, period of, of witnessing what happened around Kyiv in these towns like Irpin and Borodyanka and Bucha, which has revealed the horrors of, of Russia's occupation of those areas and tell us a lot about the intent of this conflict. Um, at the same time, there is this massing. Those, those soldiers that were in, trying to encircle Kyiv didn't disappear. They weren't fully defeated. They've been repositioned to the east of the country, to Donbass. And one of the last things I did in my uh, most recent reporting trip is I met with uh, two Special Forces soldiers who had been involved in several key battles uh, for the Hostomel airport, and, and they were the first people to get into Bucha after the Russian withdrawal. And that had all gone very well for them because they were able to use um, sort of short, uh, you know, Special Forces were very important, drones were very important. They're very concerned now about the battle in the east because it's very different. It's going to be much more of a classic clash of armies, which allows the uh, Russian advantage in artillery and air force and just the simply their larger numbers to, to be brought to bear in a flat step. So there's a lot of concern in the Ukrainian military that the second phase will be much harder than the first. OK. Um, Janice, just to contextualize, and we'll come back um, uh, as well to um, uh, to Ukraine specifically, but but in the context of, of 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 the world at large, you know, in some ways, we have a Western alliance that's been adrift for many years, and seems to have united around a very important cause. On the other hand, we uh, have only a Western alliance some days. It looks and uh, not much Asia, not much Africa, not much Latin America. So, how do you assess you know the unity of the world and and how this will play out over time? So I think uh, the most misleading phrase, unfortunately, Mark, is the whole world has united behind Ukraine. That's just not the case. It's what we hear in Canada, in the United States, in large chunks of Europe, but it's not accurate. India has not joined. China has not joined. There's three billion outsiders. Brazil is not part of this coalition, the largest country in Latin America. The United Arab Emirates are sitting on the fence um, because they have interests uh, on both sides of this. So with a little bit of exaggeration, we just count heads. The countries, the populations of the countries that have joined in support of Ukraine are a minority. So let's just understand that when we think about the world. This conflict has not divided the world. The world was divided before. So as we move forward, you know, uh, uh, through the conflict, post-conflict, what do you expect the world to look like? Will there be an iron curtain in the world? 
you know, let me, let me tell one quick story. Frankly, as Mark, uh, rightly so Mark, I think, is concerned about this next phase, which I also think will be brutal and casualties will be higher. Um, so we have all kinds of reasons to be concerned. Which country is the most important country in the world, not everybody, as we try to put a break on escalation? China. The United States, consistent outreach to China, pick up the phone and phone your friend and tell him, stop, stop, enough is enough, respect this guideline. Russia, desperately dependent on Xi Jinping. If we want a snapshot of the future, there's one where both sides of this are dependent on China, and China is standing back and, frankly, sitting on the fence as well. Mm -hmm. Mark, inside, um, uh, you were in Kiev last week, and uh, um, inside the leadership, um, uh, people who are, you know, have the chance to think about the outside world, and maybe everybody, you know, is thinking about the outside world, even, even in there, are they, um, are they looking at a world that's embraced them, or are they looking at a world that's uh, keeping its distance? At the start of the conflict, um, the Ukrainians that I know best were, were deeply disappointed in the West, and, and even specifically in Canada. They, it, the way we um, so quickly withdrew our diplomatic staff, our military trainers all left the country. There was a real feeling of abandonment. And um, famously, the uh, Americans were trying to get uh, Zelensky to consider fleeing the country, or at least fleeing the capital. And, and Zelensky's famous retort was, um, I, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And um, so that, they've that the, the Ukrainian resilience has flipped the narrative around and now the world is starting to come back to them. They're getting incredible support from the American intelligence services which has helped them keep their air force and their uh, air defenses active. So now they feel, yes, look at, look at the support we're getting from the world. They're very proud that um, the European Union membership feels like it's within grasp. They're, um, you know, they feel closer to the West. Um, but yes, they're very uh, obviously very uh, aware that this is a, um, it's the West they're attaching themselves to, not, not the international community. They don't, uh, there's not much narrative about reaching out to China or to India and the Ukrainian discourse. It's the West they're hoping will save them. Um, I'm going to come back to you on this in a moment, but I, I, I just want you, you know, everybody's fascinated by Zelensky. You know, he was an actor. He's now uh, Winston Churchill. And um, great communicator. Winston Churchill, pardon me? Great communicator. You know, great. Winston Churchill practiced 40 years to become Winston Churchill. Uh, I don't think Zelensky did. Just tell us a little bit uh, about him, his personality as, as you've seen it, his strengths and weaknesses so far in this war. He's always been a great communicator, but I think until the war began, he was, he was reticent to use this. Um, he, he was always cognizant, I think, of being the actor turned politician. Um, and so one of, his, one of his aides was telling me on Friday that they'd been trying to tell him for, for months that he should spend more time speaking to the Ukrainian people directly, going around the media. And uh, one of the most successful innovations that he or someone in his team has come up with are these nightly addresses via uh, the Telegram social media app. And whether he was always this, this character, this great strength of, uh, uh, this great leader, or whether he was created by the times, I'm sure we'll, we'll never know for sure. But it's, um, you know, the, the difference between what happened in Afghanistan when Ashraf Ghani fled in the last days and, and suddenly the army collapsed and the Taliban was in the capital and what's happened in Ukraine where he's standing and giving these nightly addresses very clearly from in his own office or sometimes in the streets of Kyiv and what that's done for the, the morale of the country and the, and the strength of the army is difficult to underestimate. Hey. Janice, um, Canada has a huge Ukrainian diaspora very politically well organized. Um, how do you see Canada moving forward? I mean, first of all, how is all this going to affect Canada's place in the world? And how much um, room for maneuver does Canada have if it wants it? You know, this, this is a crisis. And I think Mark would agree here. This is a crisis almost tailor-made. If, if we had to have a terrible crisis, this one is tailor-made for Canada because it brings to the table really all the critical assets uh, that the world needs right now. So what am I talking about? 
great networks because of the extraordinary Ukrainian diaspora in this country, which reaches out to other Ukrainian diasporas, but also right into the Ukraine, uh, as Mark had seen, and gets such valuable information in real time. That is a huge asset. A close relationship with the United States, whose intelligence outperformed expectations and reversed a two-decade, you know, black record of getting it wrong, getting it wrong. U.S. intelligence got it all virtually right, except the Ukrainian resilience and strength and leadership that Zelensky would provide. But we work closely with the United States, so we have access to all the best information, frankly. The, 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 the exports of grain and barley that are cut off as a result of what's happening there and driving up food prices all over the world there, it is, in fact, an opportunity for Canada, if we were nimble enough, to step up our game, right? Because this is the commodity that is going to drive food insecurity. And frankly, in my view, in parts of the Middle East and Africa in this next year, we're going to have civil disturbance and riots because that's what happens every time the price of wheat goes up in the world. It's so predictable. Ed. Um, and then finally, of course, energy. Um, there's no bigger issue in Europe right now than energy. Germany is, frankly, we talk about a united West, and there's a facade of a united Europe. Germany is agonizing about what it does. Um, it is an ongoing internal fight that is, I think, going to explode in public sooner rather than later. Canada is a player in global energy markets. Well, so are we? Are, I mean, we're a player on the one hand because we, you know, have uh, enormous supplies of, uh, of uh, different forms of energy, and in this case, particularly oil and gas. But we don't have the infrastructure uh, to get it out. So, are are we really a player? Well, we, you're quite right. We don't have the infrastructure to get it out. And what do we learn from this? Ed? You know, this is the growth summit. What do we take away from this? when global forces converge and we are, we are endowed with energy and wheat and barley and other foodstuffs, and we answer, yeah, but we don't have the infrastructure to get it out into world markets. I'm probably not going to answer the question I just asked myself. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions uh, up there that are in one way or another on my list, but I'd, I'd rather uh, uh, go there. And there's a question about the Global South, what it means, and you've already spoken about uh, um, you know, uh, discontent uh, uh, and, and perhaps civic, uh, civil um, uh, issues rising there. But, but I think, uh, you know, I'd also like you to address for a moment, um, there's a moral question that people keep raising about you know why Ukraine and why not mm -hmm. Yemen, why not uh, uh, the uh, um, DRC? What do you say to that? It's it's frankly that question is right on, and the answer is there is a double standard. That's all. There is a double standard in the way Europe has accepted Ukrainian refugees in comparison to the way it accepted. Afghan or Syrian refugees. Uh, now, why? The question is, why is there this double standard? Because actually, this is a European story and a transatlantic story. And that's where the alliance that you both talked about at the beginning is strong. Those are the countries that have stepped up um, and helped Ukraine after those first few days. So there is, in fact, a greater willingness by countries that border Russia, <laughs> the Polands, the Romanians, the Bulgarias, where Mark has reported from, um, there is a greater willingness by those countries to accept refugees because they live next door. And we're seeing very old kinship stories here. There is always a difference in the way um, neighbors are helped in comparison to those who live farther away. But to deny there's a double standard, it's foolish. Mark, maybe, maybe you could take that on a little bit too and, and, and how you regard that. Because you know, obviously, you've spent a lot of time 
in the region and Russia and Ukraine over the years and, and developed a lot of relationships, but you've also in the past year spent a lot of time writing about Afghanistan and getting people out of Afghanistan and you've been very personally involved with some of them who have had a rough time uh, getting through a system. So how do you regard that uh, comparison? You mean in terms of media, how the media covers something or in terms of how the, they're, they're received? Just in, in, in terms of uh, if there's a fairness or an unfairness and if it's um, um, understandable or not. I mean, in term, it, it does strike me, um, I was in Poland in November uh, writing about a, a refugee crisis at the border that was then Syrians and Afghans uh, who were coming through Belarus trying to come into Poland and the story was then about Poland, Polish border guards beating them back and the contrast between that and what we're seeing today where Poland has just opened its doors to as many Ukrainians as can cross the border is, is obvious and, and unfair. And one of the uh, Afghan refugees that had mentioned that uh, the Globe helped to escape from Afghanistan, he was a Canadian military veteran, um, he was trapped in Kyiv um, right in, through the start of this war. He'd gone from uh, escaping the war in Afghanistan to being caught in the first days of the war in Ukraine. And he managed to escape across the border in those early first days where the, in, into Poland, but found almost no help there because it was all established for Ukrainians. And so he moved on to Germany, hoping because someone had told him life would be, that, that the, there'd be more um, systematic care for, for Afghans there. And uh, it's actually in tomorrow's newspaper, but he's uh, struggling there as well because, again, there's this, uh, even in Germany, this willingness to, to go to great lengths for these Ukrainian refugees and these Afghans who have more complicated stories who've come a greater distance are just not being treated equally. Um, is that fair? No. Is that understandable? I'm not sure it's even understandable, really. I mean, these are all people who fled war zones who all have terrible stories. Um, you know, but there's clearly a government policy there to sort of help the Ukrainians. Uh, and, you know, Canadian government has also left Jawad stranded till this point. Um, there's a question about nuclear weapons, and um, I think it's important, uh, you know, we keep hearing the threats. Um, we learn the expression tactical nuclear weapons, not that many of us understand what it is. Maybe uh, you guys could explain that. I will. <laughs> yeah, how much, uh, how much jeopardy do we, you think we're in that uh, nuclear weapons could be employed in this uh, conflict? So let me just briefly tell you what a tactical nuclear weapon is. It's a very low yield nuclear weapon. Its explosive capability is less than some conventional weapons. And that's what's muddying the world. So is it less than a Hiroshima, for instance? Yes, 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 okay. And the second relevant fact here, and this is a real problem, is Russian military doctrine different from ours and from NATO's. It actually envisages using tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield, and no big deal. They don't have the same taboo that we have against any kind of nuclear weapon, and that's where the real danger lies here. And that's one of the things that I'm worried about over the next several weeks. Here, here's the paradox. The worse this gets for Putin in the Donbass on the ground over these next two or three weeks, the greater the risk of escalation. And the greater the risk that Russia will misunderstand how NATO and the United States will view any use of any kind of nuclear how, how will they view it? Well, we have tag teams in the United States who are busy right now studying this full, that's all they'll say that they are studying this full time. They are mum for good reasons on the answer. But I think it would be very, very difficult for any U.S. president to minimize that and to walk away. And, you know, when Russia tested an intercontinental ballistic missile system and Putin went to the test, it was visible. Yeah, we're saying, look, if this gets ugly, we can get uglier. Biden just dismissed it and really smart that he did and said, I'm not playing your game. It is a big gamble to expect that Biden would dismiss um, the explosion of a tactical nuke. Here's the good news, because I want everybody to sleep tonight. <laughs> we, Too late. Uh, no, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me make sure everybody sleeps tonight. The, the Russian nuclear weapons, right down to tactical level, are being monitored night and day. 
uh, by NATO and fortunately private satellite companies now, which is great. So people like me get to see the satellites in real time. There is no movement, none, zero, of any Russian nuclear weapons, not even tactical ones. Right. Mark, what's the expectation in Ukraine about this? I think um, the, the reason why Janice correctly uh, uh, referred to the next two or three weeks as being critical is there's this uh, May 9th is Victory Day in Europe. In, in Russia, it's as close to a sort of a holy uh, day as they have. It is uh, celebrated by Russians walking through the streets of their cities holding pictures of their, the people they lost in the Second World War. And I think Mr. Putin has said they are going to have a Victory Day parade this year as normal, which means they need to have some kind of victory to claim uh, it, it, to, on that date, whether that is the capture of Mariupol, whether that is um, a major battlefield defeat de given to the Ukrainian army, which may involve, I'd say, chemical weapons are the first step, and then it, to sort of escalate slowly. Uh, and then I, d I agree that tactical nuclear weapons are definitely not off the table. So I think we're in a very dangerous next few weeks where uh, Vladimir Putin is, is not going to back down. It hasn't gone well for him. He needs a victory. And he will, I fear, go to great lengths to achieve something that he can present as a victory to his people. Do you want to? I, I, I think Mark is totally right. These next few weeks are the most dangerous period of this war. What we've seen, unfortunately, is being the prelude. And this is a time, and I, I think it's important to say two things here. This is the period um, where the risk of escalation is greatest. This is the time we're going to see some awful things. The things that Mark has reported on have been awful enough, but we're going to see worse. And this is the time when our leaders in Canada, in the United States, and in other NATO countries are going to have to be at their most disciplined and most careful uh, and not respond to the waves of public outrage that may come at them. And we need to give them room to be disciplined and restrained as they navigate through these next several weeks. Okay, people um, are supposed to be going down to eat that now extremely expensive food driven up by the uh, uh, food cost security. Driven up. But uh, if, uh, if you'll indulge me for one last question or two here, or if food is ready and you go down the escalator, um, um, your choice, it's a democracy here. <laughs> uh, 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 how does this end is my question. You know, I mean, wars, wars come to an end. They do. And uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, diplomacy usually playing uh, an important role in that. How do you, you know, start with you, Janice, and go to you, Mark. You know, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say, Mark. I think we are far from the end of this war right now. Um, think about the end of a war as a dance with a partner. And both partners have to want to dance at exactly the same time. Uh, and if one side feels, oh, I've got the momentum, um, then they're not going to dance. This has been a brutal nine weeks now for Ukraine. But the sense, um, certainly as far as I gather, and I'd be interested to hear, Mark, what you say, is that Zelensky is confident now that heavy artillery is coming in, that armored cars and armored tanks are coming in, that he is getting more support. Everybody understands how tough this battle is. Uh, and so he is not actively now, in the same way as he was at the beginning, desperately searching for a way out. Putin, as Mark just said, there's no way he backs down before May the 9th. There is no conceivable way that this can happen. So we are at a stage right now where neither of the two sides is actively pursuing a negotiated end. It's off in the distance. It's not going to be an easy package to put together when the time comes either. Uh, I, want, I, want, uh, I want you to go with this too, but I also want to know, you know, perhaps in your answer, maybe Janice, you'll come back to it. Uh, you know, there were threats today of escalation. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been threats of escalation as the West gets more deeply uh, involved in supplying uh, armaments. So I, I just wonder if, if along the way toward an end, if that's uh, uh, a risk we have as well. Um, just on, on to respond to Janice's point, I mean, absolutely. I think we are uh, much, much uh, further from the end of this war than we are from the start of it. And 
Um, as I said, Mr. Putin is not going to back down right now. And what, what's changed from the Ukrainian point of view is the horrors we saw in places like Bucha, where previously ceasefire negotiations were based on the idea that Russia would stop where it is or retreat to the pre-February 24th lines. Now there is no mood in Ukrainian society for any kind of compromise that doesn't return all of their territory, which is as improbable as that is. That's the mood right now. And it'll be very, very difficult for President Zelensky to um, get a peace deal through parliament that was anything less than sort of the Russians leaving all of Ukraine. And there's a third player as well, which is the West. And even if somehow President Putin and President Zelensky came to a pact tomorrow, one of the key Russian demands would be an end to sanctions and back to business as normal with the West. And I don't think any Western leader right now, after Syria, after Georgia, after Chechnya, after Donbass, after this, thinks that we can and should return to the previous relationship we had with this Kremlin. So that leaves us stuck in every way I can see. OK. Um, <laughs> you have a final word, or are you, uh, are you content to leave us um, no, uh, I, I stand with, with between, no appetite? I stand between everybody and lunch. Uh, <laughs> but just, so just one quick comment, just to elaborate on Marx. Part of the way, the only way this war can end is if we, the West, that supports Ukraine, begins the hard internal discussion. What incentives do we put on the table for Russia to come back? If we're not willing to have that discussion, this war drags on. And what we haven't said is who is really being hurt terribly by this war? It's Ukrainians. It's their cities that are being reduced to rubble. They are suffering the casualties. And that gives them, because they are really the ones who are bearing the burden, that gives them a very powerful voice um, in the terms on which this war ends. Mark McKinnon, foreign writer, Correspondent extraordinaire, thank you for your work on the ground. The best. Uh, thank you. I want the best. And Janice, uh, the Dean of, uh, of uh, Foreign Policy Analysis in Canada, thank you for always helping us put it all together. Thank you. And lunch was served 10 minutes ago, so <laughs> grab it. <laughs>